you. Wherever you're listening. Um, our organization is the Marin County Law Library, and this project um, came about um, when we started listening very closely to other programs that we have, and that includes lawyers in the library. We've had the good fortune to have some pretty wonderful people coordinate that program, and between them and our good friend Lori, who is our law librarian, we started to hear some things that made us think about other organizations that are natural to be introducing to um, the folks that use the law library. If not for you, someone you know, these resources, especially in the time of COVID, may come in handy. You may meet someone who has a question, um, and lucky them, they run into you after an evening like tonight. Um, I'd like to take a moment to thank the people that make this possible. We started out as a face-to-face -face program. Um, it wasn't very complex. I was devious and wanted you to all come visit the law library. And since you can't, we'd like to reach out to you and continue this program. And it wouldn't be happening but for, and especially, two of my colleagues right now, and that is our law librarian, Lori Vela Olson, and our board member and current president of the organization, Chris Kirby. These two people made this a transition through Zoom, um, have opened our eyes about other possibilities for utilizing this in a more effective way, and it wouldn't be happening without them. And I appreciate very much their efforts to bring us all together tonight. While we're on this subject, I'd also like to um, acknowledge the work that Lori is doing with our website. For those of you that know, um, at this point we are still closed, um, but we anticipate at some point soon, we hope, reopening the library. In the meantime, may I invite you to take a look at what has turned into a fabulous resource on the very front page. Um, we are available to call back and answer questions. We appreciate the opportunity to help folks during this time, and if possible, refer them to necessary services. Um, on our phone tonight and joining in will be Lori, will be Chris, and in particular, I'd like to take a moment to thank very much our guest tonight, Mary Kay Sweeney, who takes time out from, and we were teasing her about this a moment ago, an increasingly busy schedule to come and talk about her services. Um, Lori has brought to our attention that there have been questions about these kind of services. We hope that you know someone that you can help with a referral with some information that you may not have heard before tonight. So I'd like at this point to welcome the Executive Director of Homeward Bound of Marin County, Mary Kay Sweeney. Thank you very much, Denise. I really appreciate this opportunity. And although this is like not in person, I can see some really familiar faces and I'm very happy to be here with you all. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I thought because we're in this particular strange time in our history, that it might be a good idea to start with an uplifting story and something that, that certainly has given us a lot of pause for gratitude and, and for recognizing that wonderful things can still happen in the midst of all this craziness that we are experiencing. So um, Chris, I know you're gonna do this little video for us. Okay. Load it up now and uh, hope you enjoy it and we'll have other things to t say after this. Thank you. Great. Go. Oleg's story. I was six years old when my father decided we'd leave Siberia. I'd be leaving my home, my friends, and communism. But we weren't allowed to leave. We'd have to escape. And to escape, we'd need a boat. My father was a highly respected engineer and mechanic in the Navy. During downtime, I'd see him working on a small kayak made of wood, bicycle parts, walrus skin, and a three horsepower, single cylinder, water cooled engine. He told me with this and a bit of luck, we'd make it over the Bering Sea and arrive at the mouth of the Yukon River. One day, the guards came, 
I saw my father's kayak. What's this? They'd ask. And my father would say, it's for fishing. The kayak was specifically designed to appear unseaworthy, so the guards believed him. Our best chance for escape was in June, when the rough weather and icy currents prevented planes and larger boats from following us. In these conditions, we knew of only six vessels that would be capable of pursuit. So we disabled them. Before the sun rose, we rode between hazardous masses of ice. When we were far enough so the guards couldn't hear, we started the motor. The further we got, the colder it became. The surrounding packs of ice began to grow. I thought the ice would slice right through the walrus skin. But my father was careful. On the second day, I saw something. It was a Siberian ship, and whoever was on it was following us. My father told me to dump the spare gasoline and provisions overboard so we could move faster, but somehow the ship continued to get closer. Then came the fog. The white, blinding wall gave us shelter, and for the moment, we were safe. Oh, no, we were low on gasoline. We'll never make it to the Yukon, my father said. So we changed course. The following day, we reached Savunga, Alaska, ending our 250-mile journey at sea. We were the first Siberian defectors to be granted asylum in the United States of America. Eventually, Soviet intelligence personnel followed my father. They harassed him without end until his mind began to suffer. He died in a psychiatric hospital. I went on to join the U.S. Navy. I didn't talk about my ethnicity to avoid discrimination. I eventually moved to California, where I lived comfortably for 35 years. Then the cost of housing grew too high. After all that had passed, I suddenly found myself homeless at the age of 80. I was also diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Life had become difficult. Fortunately, I found refuge and asylum at Homeward Bound of Marin, a nonprofit dedicated to helping homeless people. They offered me shelter and connected me to the Department of Veterans Affairs. Homeward Bound staff plotted a new path for me and were able to secure housing with skilled nursing support at the Veterans Home of California. I miss my independence every day, but I'm so grateful for the help I've been given. Thank you. I, I take refuge in that story because, you know, I can still see all of sitting in the cafeteria over at New Beginning Center uh, having lunch and uh, realizing that we found a really good solution for his housing dilemma. So we're grateful for that and for so many other people who were able to help too. So some of you who are um, on this Zoom already know a lot about us, but I think I'll just go through some of our um, what we're doing, what we have been doing, what we will be doing, uh, just to kind of give you a taste of what's going on. And I would really welcome anybody who wants a, to ask a question at any time. I really appreciate that because I get tired of hearing my own voice and you probably will be too after a little bit of time. So Chris, would you mind putting up that PowerPoint? That you yes. Thank you. Share again. Share again. Well, whoops. Whoops. Last one. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Well, there we go. We can go to the next one, actually. I guess you all know who I am. So. <laughs> Just 
we'll just give some overview and um, you want to go to number two? Do you see number two? I, I see it. Oh, can you just move to it? Uh, the next one? Okay. That'd be terrific. Okay. In the land of Zoom. I was thinking of creating a song, Zoom by Ah, but you know, because you know, we're all we're all faced with this. this is the only time we can actually see people. Zooming. So I'm changing the slides. Are you able to see them? Uh, I just have the first one on on my screen. The first okay. page. Hang on. Um, I apologize, everyone. Give us a minute. Um, Oh, I see. Okay. okay. Um, okay, so now let me come here. All right, let's try it this way. It's okay. We can figure this out. So, Homeward Bound was started in 1974 by a lot of concerned uh, folks in the various congregations throughout the county. And uh, at first it was only the shelter on uh, Mission Avenue in San Rafael, which is 430 Mission. You know, everyone calls it the Brown House. And there were four families there. There we go, thank you. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and, um, so we started with four families. Now we're up to, I don't know how many, 400, 500 people a night that we serve. But um, the organization has grown in response to the need. And um, the need is great. And I'm really frightful that uh, the need is going to get even greater as time goes on here. Um, so we offer emergency shelters uh, for homeless families and for homeless adults. Uh, we have permanent supportive housing also for families and single adults. Um, and then as we go through this, we'll talk about the job training program too and our social enterprises. And we serve roughly 1,200 people a year, uh, including families, veterans, obviously, seniors, and people with mental health or incarceration histories. So um, let's go to the next one. Okay. Uh -huh. Um, I apologize. It's not letting me do everything I want to do. Um, That's okay. Okay. Um, okay. The screen share. You know, it's been quite remarkable about, um, here we go. There we go. Um, so homelessness in Marin County and certainly people like Bill Hale and others who are, who are online know a lot about this too. Marin has the third highest rate per capita of homelessness out of the nine barrier counties. We would never have thought that because there are so many other counties where homeless folks are much more visible than they are in Marin County. We have a lot of open space so people can actually be out there, you know, and not be discovered so much or, you know, be in encampments in the hills. And so, so we do have a high homeless concentration. Um, and in our survey in 2019, every two years, we have to do a survey of homelessness in the county. Um, and people go out in droves in the last Thursday in January and, and count as many people as we can find. So the last one was done in 2019. And there were uh, 1,034 individuals experiencing homelessness in Marin, including parents and children. One of the things I get asked a lot of times is that, well, are we just importing people from other parts of the country. Uh, actually, 73% of homeless individuals in Marin have lived here prior to becoming homeless. So um, just like Oleg's story, he was here for 35 years before he actually became homeless. With the high cost of housing, it has made a lot of people really stretch to the point of not being able to afford housing here. Um, and then this next um, percentage is about you know, uh, the equity issues that we are all facing today in a very stark way. 17% um, of people experiencing homelessness in Marin are black, even though um, black folks only represent 2.8% of the overall population. So it's um, another, another reality about the inequities in this 
uh, country and county. So can we go to the next one too? Here we go. So I'm gonna focus now on the work that we try and do every day. Um, so we have family services where <clears throat> we have uh, the county's only homeless family shelter. Although right now during COVID, we also have another family shelter in a motel, thanks to Project Room Key, so, um, which is funded by the state. So we're actually providing services at a motel in Marin County in addition to our uh, shelter on, on mission. Um, and what we've done with that particular shelter in the, for the county is that families who were living in their cars during the onset of this COVID uh, pandemic, um, we brought them into a motel. So we've had up to like 20 families in a motel who, who were previously in their cars during this time. And we wanted to get them out of their cars so that they can have some kind of shelter. Um, one of the things I focus on is this third point here. 84% um, of the families who exit our programs secure housing opportunities. So that's really the focus of what we do. We want people to have a pathway home, to have their own homes. And so between the single adults and also the families, that's what we really work on. And sometimes it takes longer, especially now, to find housing than it has in the past. But, uh, but that's what we're trying to do is housing focus case management, linking to community resources and public benefits or free or low cost childcare. Of course, now there's a whole different ball game, right? So people, so let's go to um, the next slide, adult services. I love this photo because um, our most recent project was King Street. Many of you know about King Street in Larkspur. And these folks are all residents of King Street. Um, uh, they do a lot of different projects, not so much now in, together like this, but certainly <clears throat> in the past. So the last year and a half, they've uh, we've got twelve seniors who are who are living there, and it's interesting. The room you'll see it looks like there's stained glass windows there. You see in the background, and you're right, there are because this is a former convent, uh, St. Patrick's Convent, and so uh, that they're actually in the old chapel where they they do these kinds of projects too art projects and yoga classes and things like that. Um, it's been a really great program to have. And of course, we love being in Larkspur. It's right near the downtown area so folks can walk to everything. People who live in this particular, the 12 people who live here are not allowed to have cars uh, because that was one of the agreements we signed with, with Larkspur. And they're fine without them. Uh, we have bus tickets we give out to people too. And um, it's just really great to have have this place and to be in this community. This is our first effort in Larkspur, so it's really great. So um, again, the third point down, 82% of our adults who exit our programs secure housing opportunities. And that's what our aim always is, is to make sure that people have a pathway home. Okay, should we go to the next one? If you have questions, please, please ask. Um, so using a housing first approach, we work with our partners uh, targeting, right now we're targeting chronically homeless people, especially people who are most vulnerable. Um, and it's really been a tremendous effort in the past three years, especially working with our community partners, the County of Marin, Marin Housing Authority, uh, Ritter Center, St. Vincent's, all together, we're, uh, we're doing a, a name by name list of people and going through them and trying to find um, uh, their pathway home with them so that they have an option to move into housing. It's been extremely successful. Since we started this program, uh, you can see there's a 28% reduction in chronic homelessness from 2017 to 2019. Um, certainly we have a long way to go, but we're really making progress or have been making progress. I think in this, doing the name by name list, um, we've housed 183 people. Um, and that's been really, really successful. So we're grateful for that. Okay, moving along. So another thing we have here, and of course this is really being challenged right now because we have a culinary academy and, a, and the whole purpose of the culinary academy is to train people in the food industry. And the food industry has been the hardest hit of any of the industries during this COVID pandemic. Um, so what we've done with our, um, we've been able to 
retain a lot of our graduates in our training program. I'll show you why in a little bit, but um, our Culinary Academy is now shifting to focus on, on upskilling people who, are, who have been graduates of our regular culinary uh, program and we're, and we're doing a whole new curriculum based on doing things like uh, advanced knife skills. We're doing um, how to do ordering and inventory taking. Um, doing uh, inventory control kinds of things. So there's a whole new curriculum based on, on things that we, they haven't really touched on so much in the Fresh Starts Culinary Academy. So it's working really well. We have about 16 people who we're working with and we're also employing them. They're getting paid while they go to school too, as they also work for us. So it's really great. Um, can we go forward then? Yeah. So our central enterprises are really our nonprofit businesses where we actually do make money to support our programs. Um, if any of you have dogs, I would recommend Wagster Dog Treats. Um, they're in probably 150 stores right now. So um, most recently, Whole, Whole Foods signed down. So we have, we're have we selling through Whole Foods. Pet Food Express and a lot of our other partners in the community are selling these. They're delicious treats and they're also human grade, so you can eat them yourself as a snack. Um, with the various flavors that we have. Um, of course, many of you know about our Next Key Center here, where we've done a, both our chef events and also lots of other events for the community, whether they're weddings or memorial services or bar mitzvahs, bar mitzvahs. Um, obviously, we can't do that right now. So we've had to shift into other um, paid employment for our folks, and you'll see what we've done for COVID coming up. Okay, our COVID relief work. So um, we've pivoted our services from doing chef events and doing uh, other events, lunches and that kind of thing in our key room. And we've actually been supporting the community with our relief work. Um, if you go to the next one, uh, we've had, uh, we've been doing home delivered meals um, for vulnerable seniors in Marin. Uh, we've been doing, <clears throat> that has uh, just ended. It was uh, funded again through um, the state. Uh, the, it's called the Great Plates Meal Program. So we, end, we were delivering meals every day, um, both dinners and breakfasts to, uh, to seniors in the community who are identified as being vulnerable and really needing to have that kind of support. Unfortunately, we had to quit that because the funding ran out, although we kept it going for another two weeks beyond the funding. Now we're doing pantry boxes too, delivered to people in our affordable housing programs um, because they need food because the pantry is being limited. We're doing also um, relief services and homeless for homeless families and adults uh, in hotels right now. Uh, we've taken over one of the motels uh, for, for single adults, for 60 single adults, and we're doing meals there uh, for them as well, both uh, breakfast and dinner. Okay, good. Now, this is kind of an exciting part. Um, what we're doing right now, actually we've been doing it for the last three years. We've been planning on redoing Mill Street Center. Um, and as of last week, we've moved all of the residents out of Mill Street into various programs. And this is what the new Mill Street's going to look like. Now, the first floor will be a shelter, and the next two floors above will be uh, 32 units of housing for people who have extreme barriers to being housed. And uh, it's a great partnership with the County of Marin, uh, with Behavioral Health Services, who will also help staff these. Um, we expect to break ground coming soon this fall and we'll keep you posted about that. You'll probably see that in the, in the newspaper too. Um, the project cost is 15.8 million. Uh, we're closing in on that, on uh, raising all the money for that too. So uh, we've hired a, a contractor. We're ready to go with a uh, demolition of the building pretty soon in the early fall. And uh, it's pretty, pretty exciting project. Um, past all the, uh, uh, approval processes for the city of San Rafael. So it's really great. Any questions about this one? Going to be thrilling to see it. 
And then, Joan, here. Joan, how are you? Good. How are you? Good. Um, if these are the, uh, oops, not catching you. First people on this, and one big term in such a pot. Yeah. Can you hear me? Now we can. Now we can. Okay. Um. So um, one of the things that San Rafael was so concerned about was having um, uh, so many people in downtown San Rafael. 32 units seems like a lot. How did they embrace this? this? How did you um, get them to accept such density? Well, um, there's a lot of state uh, funding for these kinds of projects now and there's a lot of state uh, laws about being able to do this without having to go through a lot of hassle but seriously the city of San Rafael has been extremely supportive of this project they they've thought it was a really really good idea um, and even the height of it you know which kind of challenges everybody's height limitations you know all over San Rafael but because um, of ground floor has to be parking because it's a flood zone so we had to go up three more floors. So yeah, we've had a tremendous amount of support from San Rafael. So we've been very, very fortunate because they see the need to, I mean, they're, um, and even some of the neighbors who, some who, who have been challenged uh, or challenged this project are really in the end being supportive of it too. So it's great. Great. Yeah. Yeah. We're thrilled about it. They have that kind of support. Yeah. And tenacity. Yeah, it takes that for sure, doesn't it? You know about that. Sure <laughs> yeah, tenacity is it. You got to be in it for the long run. You know, it's not. It's not a. Yeah. It's not a sprint here. Uh, this is a, a marathon. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, as if this were not enough to work on, we're also working on this uh, project up in right across from where we are right now um, at our headquarters. Uh, we want to build. 24 units of housing for homeless veterans. And, you know, we're, we're billing this, at, this is gonna be the end of homelessness for veterans in this community once we have this, this built and opened. Um, we'll also have 26 units of housing for people ex exiting homelessness and entering the workforce. And we'll be expanding our social enterprises because as you saw from the Wagster dog treats who are running out of space in our kitchen to actually make these things. So we're gonna have a manufacturing kitchen um, so we can do this and also other pro um, products that we come up with. Uh, that groundbreaking, and this is ambitious, <laughs> will be in 2021 um, because the project cost is 25 million and we're not quite near there yet. So, <laughs> but again, the city of Novato has been completely in support of this project. It finishes off this whole, what they call the commissary triangle at Hamilton. Um, and it's called the HUD parcel. So it's something that's been designated for homeless services since the 90s. So, so we're really thrilled to be able to partner with the city of, San, of Novato, with Senator McGuire, uh, with also with the county and, and the Marine Community Foundation to really put some substantial funding behind this project. Um, it's and the Veterans Administration too. So it's gonna be really exciting to have this completed. Because you know what these buildings look like out here. <laughs> They're all dilapidated and ready to blow over in the next hurricane yeah, we don't have. So can I ask so, you another question? Do please. they have to have a job? On the 26 units of housing for people yeah. entering the workforce, do they have to have employment in order to qualify for this? They will they because they'll have, they're, they'll have to pay rent. So they'll have to, have, but you know, um, we employ a lot of people already in our workforce programs. So um, it could be that they will qualify for that as well. You know, right. Yeah. Mary Kay, could you tell us more about your workforce? Um, it sounds like it encompasses a lot and maybe it would be good to know more about it. Well, we have, you know, we've been focusing quite a lot on, on the food industry. Um, so in our social enterprises, we have people who are making the Wagster dog treats. We have people who are working in our garden. 
we have people who are making meals uh, for the folks in the motels and also all of our programs. We have we provide meals on site for our shelter programs uh, and also for some of our other programs like King Street. We provide meals there too. So we have a whole cadre of uh, of chefs or I should say cooks who are working with us. Uh, so that's part of the workforce. We also have a whole maintenance team, uh, which is part of our workforce. So we have uh, five people who uh, who do all of our kind of maintenance uh, and issues that have we have with facilities like fixing plumbing issues or electrical issues or whatever. So uh, or painting when we have a, a turnover of a unit, we have our staff goes in and redoes the whole place and gets it ready for the next tenant to come in. So. I have to tell you this too, this is really exciting to me. Um, during this whole, since March, we have actually housed almost 50 people that have found housing, which is extraordinary when you think about it. I mean, um, obviously people have gotten, um, they've, they've gotten both um, vouchers through either the Veterans Administration or through uh, Section 8. Um, so we've been able to really cobble together that kind of thing. We've had some of our folks who've been in permanent supportive housing get what, what the um, Rent Housing Authority calls move on vouchers. So they've moved on because they're more independent now and we can move people into those units now who need more support. Um, so there's quite a, quite a turnover and it's really exciting to see during this time. So Denise, I'm not sure if I answered your questions about workforce. Um, no, I'm not. I'm delighted to hear about that, and I, I actually, my first encounter was, I believe, this last holiday season. Um, you folks actually produce chocolates and candy for sale, don't you? Yes, we do. Yeah. Not during the um, summer, but we, we do during the rest of the year. Yeah. <laughs> They're called um, halos, halo truffles. Yeah. In terms of training, um, when folks actually ultimately exit the programs, what has been their success at placements? I mean, before the pandemic, probably one of the most successful elements of businesses here were restaurants. Yeah. How many folks that are graduates of the program have successfully transitioned into um, jobs prior to COVID? Prior to COVID, 85% of our folks were in jobs by the one month after graduation. So, um, during COVID, it's a whole different story. We've actually been able to employ a lot of our graduates too uh, and keep them employed. Um, but our on-call workers that we did for catering events and that kind of thing, we, we haven't been able to really keep them employed. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's been really tough on the food industry especially. Uh, and I'm not sure when that all is going to come back because even though a lot of the restaurants are doing like uh, on in street dining or carry outs, uh, it's not quite the same because they can't really employ as many people as they have in the past. So, yeah, it's a challenge. I think a lot of the restaurant or not, a lot of the grocery stores, however, are hiring people. And we've had some of our graduates get jobs in Nugget Markets or Safeway, you know, where there's a lot of meal prep being done because people are doing a lot of carry outs. So, um, so people are getting jobs there. Um, one of our most recent persons who, I think it was a week ago, she moved into housing, uh, totally, completely thrilled to death to finally get housing. And she works the safe way. And she loves her job there. So, you know, people are doing what they can to maintain, you know, in a challenging time for all of us. You know. How are all you guys doing? Are you doing okay? Yeah. I think Bill has a question. Sure, Bill. Yeah, Mary Kay, you mentioned uh, two motels here, one family, uh, one for a single, uh, like single residence house, single housing residence, SRO, I guess what I'm talking about. Are you going to be able to acquire either of those under this um, home key or uh, room key uh, funding that the state's uh, putting out to buy yeah. motels at the moment? That's a really good question. It's um, kind of an extension of the project room key into a uh, home key or something. Yeah, uh, actually it's three motels, uh, four motels that are being operated right now. Um, however, um, the county is working desperately quickly to see if they can buy a motel right now. Um, 
and I know that they've uh, they've been hustling all over the county trying to find a, a seller. Uh, and I hope that they're successful. They have one good lead, and I hope that really uh, materializes because I think it's a great opportunity. Although it's a really short turnaround time frame, and uh, but everyone of us who works with the county on these things, we're committed to making it happen if it can happen. So, so it's not a it's not a question of money. It's a question of uh, availability of the. Uh, yes. Yeah, because you know, uh, a lot of a lot of the motels don't want to sell. I'm not sure why not because it doesn't look very promising in the near future for for people being you know coming into their motels. But I guess. And well, whatever. They're not willing to sell yet. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Good question. Other questions? Yeah, Lori. I think you're muted. Yeah, there. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I was wondering, how do you, you know, I see homeless people around in the community. And so I'm wondering how, do you go out to them or do they come to you or how does that work? That's a really good question. As I mentioned before, we have a lot of good community partners who actually do a lot of outreach to people. Um, Buckaloo has an outreach team. The care team from Community Action Marin also is in touch with a lot of people. And Mitter Center sees a lot of folks who come in for health, excuse me, health services. So. We've got great linkages to everyone um, so that we don't really have to go out. People come to us then and we get referrals from people. Are you able to help people that, I know that sometimes people um, maybe are questionably eligible for, for housing because of uh, like substance abuse or, or some other issues. Mm -hmm. Do you have, what do you do about those people? Do they? <clears throat> Well, I'd like to normalize that. People who are in housing have substance abuse issues too, you know? Well, yes, that's People true. Who are in housing also have mental health issues too. So yeah, we, we work with everybody. It doesn't matter what their issues are. Um, as long as their behavior is good, um, we, are, we have what we call harm reduction. If folks have those kinds of issues, um, they can have their issues and they can have their substance dependence but they have to behave themselves. They have to be good to one another. That's our only requirement, really. Thank you. Good Thank question, you. yeah. I know there's, um, right now we're, we're at capacity in terms of the shelter, but that's because the county has also opened up an awful lot of motel rooms for people who are really vulnerable. And so uh, we're really focusing our efforts on because we have to keep social distancing at all of our sites, which is difficult to do when you got an 80 bed facility or a 55 bed facility. So we've really, um, we've, we're at capacity right now. And I have to report, this is quite an amazing thing with all of our congregate settings. We've had no positive COVID tests so far. Wow. Knock on wood a thousand times <laughs> over, but yeah, we're, we've been, re we've really, I mean, I can't believe how many times we've, clean these places over and over again but and everyone's really being very vigilant about wearing masks and hand washing and keeping distance to this afternoon for instance at new beginning center many of you have seen that place we have a courtyard inside new beginning center we had a memorial service for a staff member who passed away last week um very mm -hmm. suddenly she just had a heart attack apparently um one of our cooks in uh, in a resident too um Anyway, so we had a memorial service today and it was really quite beautiful. Everyone was really spaced out appropriately, wearing masks. And uh, we had a, you know, Father Phil Roundtree, you may, some of you may know him from Novato. Uh, he gave, he was, he led the, the service for her. And uh, yeah, it was really quite, quite remarkable. Yeah. So. Surely you must have other questions. Um, I have a question for you. Um, if you as an organization are looking ahead in the months to come with the many things that you're doing, and we have members in the community who are listening tonight or may have occasion to talk to any of us, um, what are you looking for and what kind of needs do you anticipate? Well, 
I think we're all kind of worried about what's going to happen after the eviction laws are um, released and people may not be able to pay their rents and may be forced to be on the streets. We hope that doesn't happen, but the reality is some people are going to be losing their housing. And so I guess what we, what we need is support to build these buildings I've been talking about as soon as possible so we can get people housed and have more um, options for folks to go to. Um, so um, we have capital campaigns coming up for both of these new projects and whatever kind of support people can lend for that would be really, really appreciated. Everyone always accuses me of being a woman of few words and that's what happens. You know, I, I never go the distance on these things because I'm actually a poet and not a novelist. So I end up, you know, spending very few words. <laughs> yeah. I have a question. Is there any, I know with COVID you can't do the monthly chef dinners. Yeah. Any possibility of doing them remotely? Oh my goodness, thank you. This is something I had in my notes, but at the end of the day, Sure, we've actually done two virtual happy hours already. Uh, and another one's coming up September 10th with Dusky Estes, you know, from, you know, Iron Chef. She's really, really good. Um, she's going to be actually, she started a nonprofit because she had to close her restaurant, Zazu. Um, and she's the one who, who has uh, really great bacon, although we're not going to be featuring that. We'll be sending whoever signs up for it by a certain date. <laughs> and pays the fee, we will be sending a bottle of wine. Uh, oh. And we've done that the last time we did, we partnered with Point Race Cheese. So we sent a package of cheese to people. And the first one was of Joanne Weir. We sent a bottle of wine to everybody then too. Even some of my friends on the East Coast I signed up for and they got <laughs> wine or cheese, you know, they're really happy. So September 10th, yes, sure, okay. mark that it. It should be a lot of fun. And uh, we've worked out all the kinks. So um, we've got, you know, people doing it from their garage and all that kind of stuff to make sure that it gets the great coverage that it gets zooming. Is it possible to get a link that we could put on our Facebook for this event? You know, if you go to our website, that would be the best link. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. I, I can do that, Denise, because I've attended many of the lunches or the dinners. That's great. Good. And I'll send you um, the flyer I have too made up for it. So that's good. Thank you for mentioning that, Chris. <laughs> good advertising. <laughs> Mary, Mary Kay, you might also send a couple to um, a Laurie here to put they have two nice bulletin boards in the law library. Oh, wait a minute. Nobody's going in the law library yet. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You must have a virtual bulletin board, right? Yeah. Um, it looks like Betty has a question. Betty, Betty if you can unmute yourself. Now, can you unmute? Bound for all the work they've done. They've, you've grown Mary Kay through the years and just I'm overwhelmed with all the things you've expanded. I would like to ask you to comment, how can the average person who maybe doesn't have as much money that has talent, how can they commun how can they contribute to Homeward Bound? Mm, thank you, Betty. And you certainly have been a supporter for many, many years. Thank you. Um, you know, I think right now, we aren't um, actually having volunteers come because it's, of course. Close, you know, but certainly we've had quite a rich number of volunteers who have provided so many terrific services here, um, whether it's making meals down at Mill Street mm -hmm. or, you know, working in the garden or maybe helping to tutor a child or whatever. There's, there are opportunities that will come up once we get over this hump, you know, and, uh, we look forward to working with you on whatever you would like to do. I have another comment. I just thought of a way I could help you. If I had the information about your event, yes. I have many, many contacts that I could put, help put the word out. Terrific. Is that a, I mean, in some way you could send me the information. That'd be great, Betty. I put it on my Facebook. I'll send it out to all my emails. I have a lot of good contacts. So good. maybe I can help that way. I didn't even know you were having that event. That's wonderful. Sure. Um, can you send me your email address? So I'd I be happy to. Terrific. Thank you very much. What a great idea, Betty. 
Thank you. I'll send it to all the rest of the people who were signed in tonight too. I'm sure they'd want to do it. Sure. It's a lot of fun actually, you know. And it usually starts at five and just goes to six. So it's really quite, you know, it's just a happy hour. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Mary Kay. Thank you, Betty. One of these days we'll see you all in person, I hope, <laughs> at a chef event. Has your staffing changed during COVID, either up or down? You know, um, one of the things our board of directors okayed during COVID was to give what we call gratitude pay. So we gave folks extra money to work. Um, and we were, because we were kind of afraid that we would lose people during this time, uh, either because of, you know, family obligations or because they were afraid to come to work, you know, especially working with so many people in our congregate settings. But we didn't lose anybody, you know, which is really quite remarkable. Yeah. Got a great team here. So does that so does that mean they're they are working remotely or they are um, just kind of on furlough? No, no. Everyone's working. They have to work on site because we provide services right here on site. Uh, there are some of our staff who can work remotely. Some of our finance team or development team, they can work remotely mm -hmm. and have. Um, but most of the people are direct service providers. So, you know, and the chefs have to be here. The cooks have to be here. Um, people who are doing um, the shelter services have to be on site. Um, and with our permanent supportive housing sites, they've been able to work uh, remotely a lot of the times and connect by phone or Zoom with people. But they've also gone on site with folks too when there's been problems. So, yeah. Good question. Thank you. So I'm in my like 27th year here now. And in so many ways, I feel like I'm just starting because there's just so much that needs to be done and so many new ways of doing work that we're always freshening up ourselves and trying to be as relevant as we possibly can, you know? Yeah. It's a privilege to do this work. Anyone else have any other questions? Oh, Betty has another question. Go ahead, Betty. Yay. Oops, mute. You gotta unmute. Yes, I will. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Good job. Um, in my travels around Novato and other places in the county, I see many homeless people. Yep. What can I tell my friends, my associates, that might be helpful in seeing these people in a different light or giving them some words of wisdom, some words of help. I'm not quite sure, but we see these people and we don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. What can we do as a person just hanging out in, in town? Yeah. I, this is always a difficult yeah. question because so many of those folks um, are not, wanting necessarily to come into a shelter or whatever. But I think the most important thing we all can do is to greet somebody, to smile at them, to let them know that we believe they're human beings just like us. Um, I think that's critical. You know, um, I know a lot of people are troubled by, well, should I give people money? Should I? Well, that's up to you. But I think the most important thing is to treat each other like human beings, like we would want to be treated. That's that to me does it all. And whether or not someone wants to come into shelter, that's desperately their choice. I mean, they, that's totally their choice. And, um, and right now we're not taking anybody in anyway. So, um, you know, that would be an option right now. But uh, just, I think just, just being human is really a critical. Good answer. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mary Kay, can you tell us about how you got started with 
this organization 27 years ago? <laughs> yes, it's an interesting story, I think. Um, um, actually, 27 years ago, um, I got a call from the person who um, was the deputy director here, and her name is Chris uh, Harris, and she said to me, hey, I've got this program we're starting in a motel. It's for families, for homeless families. It's just a four-month pilot. Do you want to do it? And I said, yeah, I think it'd be really great. So I was expecting it to be four months long. And uh, here, here I am, you know, uh, 27 years later. But uh, I fell in love with the work and with the people. Uh, to me, it's been um, an absolute gift. So I feel really fortunate to have, to have found my home here. And then I, How, I rose to the ranks, you might say. Um, you know, I became the program director for families and then the deputy director. And then reluctantly, I applied to be the executive director only because people were asking me and begging me to do it. And I thought, I can't do this. It's just not possible. I can't do it, you know. But um, if you see the la that last slide we have up there is, I, I can do it with a lot of other people's help, <laughs> let me tell you. You know, our, our leadership team is phenomenal, so I'm fortunate, beyond fortunate to have them. How quickly did Marin realize you were here to stay? Did Marin? Um, As an organization, that, that, that this was not going away and that it was going to grow and build? Well, I think they realized when the homeless population grew, that this is something that we all need to get behind and figure out how we can provide the kinds of services to people who are falling into homelessness to get them on their journey home. So I think it has to do with the reality of homelessness here um, and all across the country. This wasn't an issue. I have to tell you, when I started in 1993, every single family who came, came through our program was able to get into housing even if they were on welfare. That's how much different the prices were, the rents were back then, that they could actually afford it. So even on welfare, which isn't very high, as you know. So, and now it's just like out of reach for so many people without a subsidy of some kind. What are the Section 8 numbers looking like for folks coming out of your program? Well, there's a limited number of Section 8 certificates that, that are available each year, new ones. And right now there are 50 that, um, that are being um, passed through to people. There's over 2,000 people on Section 8 certificates in this county. But, um, but every year we just hold our breath and hope that there's going to be more of them available through HUD so that we can actually get people into housing. So, yeah, we've been able to house a lot of people this year actually through both the HUD VASH, which is the veterans version of Section 8. Um, they've also been able to release many of the um, vouchers for folks who are veterans, which has been very helpful too. So yeah, um, wherever there's a possibility for getting people into housing, we're, we're about that, you know. Have the number of vouchers um, or the rate of vouchers changed in the last, the last three and a half years in this administration? You know, um, no, they've stayed relatively the same. Yeah. Um, and what's happening now, well, I don't, probably shouldn't get into this, but with the rents being as high as they are, uh, and with people, you know, when folks get into, have a Section 8 and get into their housing, it's based on their income. They pay 30% of their income. Uh, but if their income goes down, the housing authority has to pay more and more money. So, because uh, say your income is now zero, it was like a thousand bucks a month and now it's zero, then their Section 8 certificate has to be adjusted for that. And therefore the housing authority has to shell out more money for them. That makes it really hard because that means that the housing authority can go into shortfall and not issue any more certificates. And that's so, and that's what we're heading for right now, unfortunately.
with the amount of unemployment, you know, because a lot of people on Section 8 are working too, you know, or were working. It's been great to see some of you guys because I haven't seen in a while. <laughs> Are there any other questions for Mary Kay? Great. Denise, do you want to wrap up? Mary Kay, thank you so much for this evening. Um, we hope in the future you'll come visit us again and let us know how things are going. And we hope very much that we're better informed for any clients or folks that are asking information about Homeward Bound. Um, we appreciate hearing about your contact with New Beginnings. We had the good fortune to have the director come and speak earlier. And um, I know they're doing some great work with record expungement and it sounds like you had a very moving experience there today. Um, we're just glad you came, and we hope um, you'll come again. Oh, thank you very much for the offer. I appreciate being here and seeing all of you. Yeah, it's great. Thank you. See you September 10th, right? <laughs> yes. Thank you. See you then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for participating. Be well, everybody. Be well and be safe. Bye. 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 Thanks so much, and everyone have a safe evening. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.